such a long day. Oof. I'm very hungry also. I've not eaten anything. What should I do? Should I maybe make my own food? I have to get all the raw materials, cut and cook them. Or I could just order my food in. I mean, I know I'll be dependent on someone else, but at least I'm going to get my food ready made, right? Wait, where's my phone? I think I should just order some food in right away. How often does this happen to you that whenever you are low on energy, the first thing that you seek for is to get some food and get yourself energized? Now, when we talk about this concept of energy, we know that to do any activity, whether it's an external activity or an activity within our body, we need energy. So simple activities like maybe cycling or jogging, all of this needs energy. And if you do some strenuous activities like heavy lifting, you require a lot of energy. As a matter of fact, even when you are resting and you think that you don't need energy, you actually require energy as well. But for energy, we need some fuel, right? And what is this fuel that drives our body that we're able to carry out all of these functions? Well, that's what we are going to be learning in this particular video where we will learn about the types of nutrition. So without waiting, wasting any more time, let's get started with this. So the first thing that we need to do is to understand what is nutrition, right? So let's start off with a simple understanding that nutrition is nothing but taking in food and of course utilizing it. So when I asked you the question of what is the fuel that drives our body? It is nothing but the food that we eat. But why do we call the food as a fuel? Simply because the food that we eat consists of a lot of important components called as nutrients. And our body requires these nutrients for growth, it is needed for development, right, for repair, and most importantly, to carry out every activity, we needed energy, right? So for energy, we need this food. So first and foremost, we need to take in the food and this food needs to get utilized. And that is what we understand as nutrition. Now that we know that for every living organism, we know that food is a necessity, right? So the thing is, do all living organisms take in the food and utilize it in the same manner? What do you think? Take a moment right now and you can give me the answer yes or no right away as you are seeing this video. I'm sure most of you have given me the correct answer. As a matter of fact, the answer here is no, right? Not all organisms obtain the nutrition in the same manner. But we do know that living organisms need nutrients and they need to obtain nutrition. So what are the two modes or what are the modes in which they obtain this? It's very simple. So we have two broad modes, which is autotrophic mode of nutrition and heterotrophic mode of nutrition. So earlier in the video, when you saw me coming in really tired, low on energy, I had two options with me. I could either make my own food or I would be dependent on somebody. So it's pretty much how modes of nutrition work. You can either make, organisms will either make their own food or they will be dependent on another organism for food. So organisms which are having the ability to prepare their own food, we call these organisms or we say that these organisms exhibit autotrophic mode of nutrition and we call such organisms as autotrophs. So if you see the word auto means self. And trophos here means nutrition. That means these organisms will take simple raw materials, simple inorganic substances from their surroundings and they will prepare their own food. And we know that the most common example of organisms that prepare their own food are nothing but green plants. But we also know that certain microorganisms like cyanobacteria and a few other bacteria have the ability to prepare their own food. And we will learn more and more about this in our later classes as well. Now moving on to the next mode of nutrition, that is heterotrophic mode of nutrition. Now in heterotrophic mode of nutrition, if I break the word down, hetero means others and trophos or trophic means nutrition. So as simple as if I were to now, you know, maybe use a delivery application and order in some food. I'm not preparing my own food at home, but I'm depending on somebody for the food, right? So that's pretty much how a heterotrophic mode of nutrition works with a simple, like if I have to give you a simple analogy. So a heterotrophic mode of nutrition is a mode where organisms are dependent on 
other organisms for their food. And we call these organisms as heterotrophs, right? So all the animals that are there, they do exhibit heterotrophic mode of nutrition. Now we know that food that comes from other organisms, right? So if animals are dependent on other organisms for food, the food in itself has a lot of complex substances. So if I were to maybe put it in a simple analogy, right? So whenever you buy in certain food, the food comes packaged, it will have a lot of wrapping in it, right? And we know that the way it comes is very different from maybe how it would be when we serve it at home, yes? So we know that there are certain processes that we need to implement to sort of unpack it, make it more accessible, right? So pretty similar what happens or at a larger level or at an organism level when we talk about heterotrophic mode of nutrition. Now the thing is, the food that we eat has the nutrients which exist in a complex form. Now it is not that as soon as the food enters into our body, our body will just start to utilize it. No. It first needs to get converted into something what I would commonly call as a usable form, right? Something that can be used by the body. And we see that it gets broken down into usable, simpler forms, right? And we see that there are certain chemicals in our body which facilitate this. And we call them as enzymes. Now, enzymes are popularly referred to as biocatalysts. Now, again, a very fancy term you will see in your NCRT textbook. Now, catalysts are nothing but chemical substances which accelerate, right? Or simply say that it's kind of like a nitro boost in your bikes, right? It accelerates or it increases the rate of a chemical reaction. But the thing is, these catalysts are very smart. They'll not get involved in the chemical reaction. They're like, yes, yes, happen faster. It should happen at a faster rate. But they'll be like, hey, I'm not getting involved in this. And because we find these catalysts in a biological organism, we call it as a biocatalyst. And we see that there are enzymes which facilitate this breakdown of complex food substances into simpler, usable forms, right? So that's what basically happens. Now the thing is, do all organisms eat the same kind of food? As a matter of fact, no, right? Because if you talk about deers, we know that deer feeds on stationary organisms like plants, right? But if you talk about a tiger, tiger is actually feeding on a mobile organism or something that is moving. So all organisms that exhibit heterotrophic mode of nutrition have certain strategies that they will implement, right? Certain techniques in which they will obtain their food, right? So their body design and everything will make sure that they will be able to obtain their food in the best possible way. And broadly based on this, we can categorize them into three categories or three types of heterotrophic mode of nutrition, where you have holozoic mode, saprophytic mode and parasitic mode. Now on a board examination front, whenever you are watching this, right, or whichever year you are watching this, on a board examination front, holozoic mode of nutrition is very, very important. So we are going to spend some amount of time trying to understand this. Now, what do I mean by holozoic mode? Now, holozoic mode of nutrition is one where the organism will take in the food, right? So they will take it in internally, yes? So they will take it in internally and this breakdown of food takes place within the body, right? So basically, you're taking it into the body, breakdown is taking place internally, everything is happening inside, okay? Nothing is happening outside. And the most common example of an organism that exhibits holozoic mode of nutrition is nothing but us human beings. Now, holozoic mode of nutrition has five steps in it. And these are steps that we are aware of, right? So the first thing in holozoic mode is to take in the food, right? So if, body, if the food has to go inside, it needs to first be taken in. So this is what we call as ingestion, right? Now, once the food is taken in, the next thing that needs to happen is that it's in the complex form, which means it needs to get broken down into simple usable forms. So that is what we call as digestion. Yes. And once the food is digested and completely digested, it then needs to get absorbed so that it can go to different, different parts of the body. So then we have absorption. Yes. And once it has reached all the different parts of the body, it will then get utilized. And this utilization is what we call as assimilation. And whatever is not needed, it's not that all parts of the food are fully utilized. There are certain parts that our body does not require, right? Whatever is not required needs, need, need not be there inside our body. We can get rid of it. That is what we call as ingestion. 
yes so this what we see are the five steps of nutrition now the thing is in our body we have a dedicated digestive system that is responsible for carrying this out and we will learn in greater detail as to how this organ system works but what about other organisms is it that every organism that exhibits holozoic mode of nutrition will have a digestive system as a matter of fact no there are certain unicellular organisms like amoeba paramecium which exhibit holozoic mode but they don't really have a digestive system but they have a very simple mechanism in which they follow the same steps so if we talk about amoeba we know that it is a unicellular organism which does not have a proper shape or i can say it as an indefinite shape no shape at all kind of like slime if you've seen slime right slime does not really have a proper shape but when amoeba requires food what will it do it will make temporary extensions very important keyword right so we see that it will make temporary extensions called as pseudopodia right so pseudopodia here means false feet and they project themselves out where when they encounter a food particle they will extend their pseudopodia and they will trap it resulting in the formation of a food vacuole right now once the food vacuole is formed within the food vacuole digestion takes place where the complex food particle is broken down into simpler soluble forms and once it is broken down we know that it is then transferred to different parts of the amoeba's body or it is absorbed and then it is utilized or assimilation takes place and whatever is not required is then given out of the body through ingestion so this is how holozoic mode is exhibited in amoeba but in the case of paramecium the story is quite different because unlike amoeba that does not have a proper shape paramecium actually has a definite shape right so when paramecium has a definite shape we see that they have these hair like structures called as cilia that help in collecting the food and there is a definite spot right so we see that there is a definite spot through which the food is actually taken in and then we see that food vacuoles are formed and more or less the same process takes place as we saw in amoeba so we see that this is how holozoic mode of nutrition takes place at different levels whether it's unicellular organisms or multicellular organisms right that but this again goes about talking about organisms that exhibit holozoic mode but do all organisms show holozoic mode as a matter of fact no there are some organisms that cannot break things within their body they have to break it outside their body and then only they can take it up and such organisms show saprophytic mode of nutrition now the most common example i can give you here is that of fungi right so what happens is fungi don't have the mechanism where internally they can break it down so what they do we see that they break down so we see that they break down complex food substances outside the body right so they break it outside their body by with the help of the enzymes that i spoke to you about they break down these complex substances into sol simple soluble forms and then they will absorb it okay and mainly we see that they are found depending on dead and decaying matter which is why we call them as or why we say that they exhibit saprophytic mode of nutrition and then we have the last category which is parasitic mode now your parasitic mode is kind of like your robbers right you have thieves and robbers who just break into like a house and they take everything of the owner and then they just run away right so your parasitic mode of nutrition or organisms that exhibit this are kind of like those thieves and robbers and we call such organisms as parasites so your organisms like your lice and your ticks we see that they are dependent on another organism entirely for its food right so these organisms are called as parasite and the organism in which they are completely dependent on the house owner you can say we call those organism as the host organism and they will probably we see that they are entirely dependent so they will never really kill the host organism but they will feed on it and we see that in plants also we observe such organ such you know parasites and cascuta or amarbale is your you know most common example that is there So broadly, when you talk about it, we have two categories, right? We have autotrophic mode of nutrition and we have heterotrophic mode of nutrition, and the different types that are there. But is biology, right, or living organisms as simple as black and white, right? Is it as simple as I'll categorize them into two categories? Funnily, and of course, we know that biology is full of exceptions. That's not the case. 
there are some organisms which are partially autotrophic and partially heterotrophic. So I want you to tell me in the comments of this particular video as to which organism that is. You already have a clue on the screen as well. And I want you to tell me why is it that they exhibit partially or why, or why we call them as partially autotrophic or partially heterotrophic. So with this, of course, we come to the end of this particular video. Now, as you know, here at Baiju's, we believe that learning comes easy when you are able to relate it to your surroundings. And we take your examination prep very, very seriously here. So if you found this particular video helpful, then please understand that we here at Baiju's have got you covered. So make sure that you do express your love to us by liking this video. You share this video with your friends if you found this insightful. And do not forget to hit the subscribe button on this video as well. I will see you all very soon but up until then everybody take care, lots of love and bye bye!